All right, good morning. Recording this on a Sunday. We're going to get through the rest of Unit 3, so 3.6 through 3.9. Uh, most of the first part of our Unit 3 video cover just general population characteristics. Uh, this is going to focus more on human population dynamics. And we're going to start with age structure diagrams. So an age structure diagram is a way to look at the breakdown of a population by specific age groups as well as male and female. What this allows us to do is potentially make predictions about what is happening in that country in terms of its growth rate. Our four examples shown at the top there uh, can be basically broken down into growing or expanding rapidly, growing slowly, a stable population in which there's very little to no growth in the population size or a declining population. Uh, one of the biggest factors here is in determining this is what are the breakdowns for the population in terms of the pre-reproductive and reproductive ages. All populations have older post-reproductive populations. They don't really contribute to population growth. Uh, what we'll see more there is what happens with uh, longer ages as far as, you know, medicine getting better, healthcare getting better, and populations living longer. The bottom one in the blue is the pre-reproductive, basically uh, below 15 years of age. If we have a large cohort in that area of the population, then we expect to see a uh, growth occurring, whether it's a rapid or slower, depending on how much of that population is found in that pre-reproductive age group. If it's roughly equal to the reproductive age group, that means that those individuals are more or less replacing themselves. Uh, we're going to see stable growth, uh, stable population or some slow growth. If the Pre-reproductive group is the smallest cohort, as you can see all the way on the far right there. That means that population is likely to be declining in the future. Again, same example showing uh, what we've seen. We want to look for the shape, right? A wide base triangle or a triangle in general are going to indicate growth. The wider the base, the more rapid that growth is. Uh, more or less vertical bars in our pre-reproductive and reproductive group is going to mean stability. And then if we have basically an upside down triangle among those two groups, right, the top is always going to have a, a different shape to it because as all populations get older, individuals uh, start to die. But if our pre-reproductive and reproductive age groups have this upside down triangle shape, then that means that we've got a declining population. So if we were to look at the diagrams here, our highest growth rate in this example is going to be India, followed by the United States, China, and then Germany. Uh, and this is largely based on the fact that we've got a variety of individuals at the different ages compared with of the pre-reproductive ages compared with the reproductive age groups. Next is fertility rates. And fertility rates, there's a few different pieces of information that we can gather here. Uh, fertility rates are largely governed by a few different factors, and it has everything to do with women in the population, as well as their ability to access education, family planning, as well as any government policies related to that. So first off, what is each part of the fertil fertility rate that we're going to look at? First is total fertility rate. Total fertility rate is a number we use that is basically the average number of children that a woman in a specific population will have throughout her whole lifetime. The higher the total fertility rate, that means a higher birth rate and typically a higher population growth rate, meaning a population that's going to be growing rapidly. The other fertility rate number that we look at is what's called replacement level fertility. Now you're going to see a couple of different numbers in a few different areas here. Essentially, we can't think about it in terms of just two to two, right? In theory, two parents having two children should replace them, but that number is actually slightly above two. Here in the slides, it says 2.1. I've always taught it as 2.2 because I think 2.2 is just easier to remember and we're splitting hairs here. But the fact is that it's got to be 
bigger than two because you're going to account for uh, individuals who are born but never reach reproductive age and die ahead of time. Women, therefore, that do not have children. Uh, individuals who choose not to have children despite making it to reproductive ages uh, or those that physically can have children. So that number has to be slightly above two for replacement level fertility. But it's going to be just above two, which does make sense given that Generally speaking, two adults having two children would keep st stable population size. So anything that's really higher than 2.2 or further away from 2.2 on the high end of the scale, that's going to mean faster growth. Anything that's below that 2.1 or 2.2 number, and especially below 2, that population is probably going to be declining in size. Another factor we'll, look, uh, we'll talk about and look at is infant and child mortality rates. Um, these are the death rates of children in a population under one year of age. Um, child mortality rate is the similar number, but it deals with children under the age of five. As you can imagine, when there's less access to healthcare and clean water and food, that number is going to be higher. Uh, so more developed countries are going to have lower child and infant mortality rates. Now, where this links with fertility rate, and this will become obvious when we talk about the last topic here, demographic transition. If you have a higher infant mortality rate, more children dying, then that means that fertility rate is going to be higher because families are going to continue to have children, hoping that enough of them will survive. Again, this is something that we would, will see in developing countries uh, when we look at our demographic transition. Now, what brings down one, uh, mortality rates among infants and children is going to be things that just allow for better survival. And in our population... That's going to be food, access to food and a more reliable food supply, access to clean water, uh, waste removal systems. So, you know, the advent of indoor plumbing is usually one of the biggest ones in that aspect. And access to health care, hospitals and doctors, vaccines, uh, and prenatal care. Things like supplements uh, for moms for pregnant women, uh, and pregnant women as well as and in the access to healthcare, we're also going to include things like access to obstetricians and uh, prenatal doctor care. So as you can imagine, affluence development is going to affect total fertility rate. Now, as affluence starts to trickle into different populations, we see a few different effects of that. One is that as countries become richer, that means there's more working opportunities, more educational opportunities. So as women have more economic opportunities, you know, in order to work, um, as well as go to school, we see total fertility rates drop. Generally speaking, if there's less time, uh, more time in school or, or working is less time for family uh, to have children. With development of countries, we also get what's called what we're, we're going to call access to family planning. So that means education about family planning, contraceptives, just the general concept of, you know, what you can do if everything is not necessarily about having children. We also start to see a, a later age of first pregnancy in developed countries, as well as just fewer overall children being born. Because now, what essentially what would have been a uh, reason to have children in agricultural developing countries is to essentially be able to work and have labor on farms and in within the household. As economic opportunities change and things become more salary job based. Uh, we start to see less of a need for that, so less children are needed in order to be able to do that labor. Government policies also affect TFR. There's a few examples of this, things like tax incentives to have fewer children. In the United States, we're actually the opposite. There's more tax incentives for having children. You, you know, there's a different tax rate for that. Um, China's original one-child policy, which has now changed to a two-child policy, um, is an example of a government policy. Um, business loans uh, that allow women to start businesses. Those are things that can play, uh, that can have effects on fertility rates. 
we mentioned more access to family planning and contraceptives, educational opportunities, et cetera. And you can see how um, there's a relationship on the graph here between the number of births per woman, the total fertility rate, and average income. Higher income countries, um, that fertility rate drops very low on this end of the scale. Uh, if income is lower, fertility rates still remain high. Uh, and we can see the same thing here for education. On the right side of the scale, we have more education, more years of schooling. The United States being here, fertility rate closer to two. With less education in countries where women get still get and receive less education, fertility rate is still very high. All right, for 3.8 population dynamics, uh, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. But things to keep in mind is that everything is affected by what's going on as far as fertility rates, uh, by what's going on within that country. Uh, and those things all will then impact population growth or decline or stability. Now, the reason we talk about this topic is because we did mention carrying capacity and populations having a carrying capacity. Uh, Thomas Malthus theorized that Earth does have a carrying capacity and it's probably based on food production and human population growth, as with all population growth, can be exponential on a J-shaped curve, but the way that our food is grown is can only increase linearly and that would eventually lead to a deficit where there's less food to feed people and we would hit our carrying capacity however humans have had the ability to alter the carrying capacity specifically to food production uh, with the help of technological advancements which was something that malthus really couldn't have predicted at his time Uh, to the point where we've seen massive increases in our ability to get food and have food available for uh, for the population. We'll talk more about that in our agricultural and land unit, Unit 5. Now, the way that we look at this brings us to our a little bit of a math review, which we'll spend a little bit more time on in class, but there are some specific things to know. One, as far as math goes, uh, is calculating growth rate. We mentioned the births minus deaths, immigrants minus emigrants for population change. When we look at human populations, we don't usually look at the number of individuals because human populations are so large. So we typically break it down into one of two ways. One at the bottom you're seeing here is growth rate. Uh, growth rate is the percent change. And that can be found a couple of different ways. Obviously, it is a percentage, right? A growth rate of 5% means that for a population of 100, they grow to 105, right? That would be a 5% increase. Typically, the data we look at with humans is crude, meaning it's not percent or per 100, it's per 1,000 people. This usually takes away the decimal point in the population percent growth rate percentage because we look at humans as whole numbers of humans. Uh, so, for example, a crude birth rate of 20 means that there are 20 births per 1,000 people in a population, and a crude death rate of 8 would mean 8 deaths per 1,000. To get that to a percentage is very easy, since these numbers are based out of 1,000. If we divide it by 10, we get it per 100, which would be percent, and that's how we would go back and forth between that, uh, those pieces of data. One thing to note, if it says the word crude, that means we are talking about 1,000. If we just see growth rate, we are talking about per 100 or percentage. Where we can use this number, and this is a piece of math that always pops up on our AP exam, is the rule of 70. It is not a an exact formula. It's a way of estimating, so keep that in mind, but it is something that you can use for doubling time. The rule of 70 gives us an approximation of the number of um, the amount of time in years that a population will take to double at its current growth rate. So given the last example of a growth rate of 1.2%, doing 70 divided by that growth rate of 1.2, right? Ignore the percentage when we do rule of 70 and just take the whole number. So 70 divided by 1.2 means a doubling 
time of 58.3 years. Now that's an estimate because we know that things change amongst the population and growth rates are not consistent over all that time period. It's just a way to get a snapshot, a picture, a moment in time of what that can look like. Uh, taking into account some of the things that we've we've talked about uh, for factors that increase or decrease population growth rates. Obviously, we, more births is going to lead to higher growth rate. Higher death rates will decrease population. Um, populations are going to grow faster the more they're able to stay alive. And we'll talk about this more demographic transition about how that happens. which is our final topic here. So in demographic transition, we look at the predictable pattern of population growth over time and changes. Each stage has a very specific outcome for birth rates, death rates, and natural increase, basically what happens when you put those two things together. We'll go through all four of them. Uh, in our class, and because you may see both of these things, in terms of College Board for AP Environmental Science, demographic transition has four stages. There are other outlets that will talk about a fifth stage. We do not have a fifth stage in AP Environmental Science. We only talk about four. All right, let's get into our demographic transition topic. So first is the pre-industrial. At the pre-industrial stage, we have high birth rates and high death rates because high infant mortality rate and a uh, high death rate due to a lack of access to things like food and healthcare and water. This means that we're going to have a high fertility rate because as more of those babies die, more of those infants die, children die, they don't survive. The parents continue to have children. We also have lack of education and uh, economic opportunities. We're still very, again, pre-industrial. So the general idea is that there's no growth here, despite having very high birth rates and death rates balancing, balancing each other out. So even for with fertility rates, maybe upwards of six or seven here, that meaning six or seven babies born on average to a woman, we don't expect all of them to survive. Maybe two of them do, which is why we get a balance out there. Today, virtually no country is in this phase. When we get to stage two, this is where we start to see the first, the real, really the biggest change. And this is where population growth happens. This is where the industrializing uh, country starts to get access to things that slow the death rate down, right? Prevent death. So we're talking about access to clean water, access to doctors and vaccines, more food, all of those things. However, the birth rate remains unchanged because we still don't have a lot of educational and job opportunities for women, and we get the generational lag. Essentially, if everybody has been used to having six or seven children without them surviving, and all of a sudden, we start to have changes to the population where, and changes to the societal structure, where now those children are surviving, it takes time for that to sink in. So because of that, we're going to have very high birth rates in stage two and a declining death rate. And those two things together are going to lead to an increase, a natural increase in the population size. When we hit stage three, the developed, the industrialized society, now the modernized economy means more family income. So we're going to see fertility rates declining because of educational and job opportunities, delayed ages of, first, of marriage and first child, as well as the discussion and access to contraceptives and, and the concept of family planning. When this happens, the birth rate starts to decline. By this point, all the modernizations in the industrializing, developing stage two are still in effect. They don't change. They don't get worse. So the death rate continues to remain to decrease and or remain as low as it possibly will get as the birth rate declines to get closer to it. So the population is still growing in stage three, but it's now growing much more slowly. And that eventually leads us to stage four, which is the post-industrialized or the highly developed society. Here, the birth rates and death rates are uh, about equal, very low. 
We may even see the birth rate drop below the death rate as populations get older and we have an increasing aging population. Uh, and we start to see birth rates drop below that replacement level number now. This, these are going to be countries that might have fertility rates in like the sub-2 uh, area. Now again, this graph here, we need, and these pieces of information that go along with each stage, we need to know this, and we need to be able to explain this, and we need to have this concept understood, because having this concept understood links a lot of the different pieces of the human population part of this unit together. And that's going to be the end of our unit three video. We'll cover this in class next time we meet.